Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him by through that I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And the fact he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. And of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor, of course, I know what a compressor does. I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an Ampeg SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles, it's one thing, that was, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes. Even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because... Uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. And there's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, people don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. Hi, this is Charles Martin. I'm here at Abbey Road Studio 2 talking about Hello Goodbye. Hello Goodbye was recorded on the 12th of October 1967 in this room, Studio 2. Um, it's funny for me, I think for anyone in, who knows the Beatles stuff, it's, it's a, it was a funny time for the Beatles. Brian Epstein had died. It was the first single to be released after Brian Epstein had died. And he was such a, an imposing force in the Beatles, a positive force. And this song was recorded at the same time as Iron the Walrus. And for me, they're two such different songs. And they really showed the beginning of a, of a, of a, of a, of a division between John and Paul, as far as their writing styles goes, and as far as what they thought you know, was, a, was a hit song. Uh, John once said to my dad, you know, I wouldn't expect to be in a bar in Spain and to have someone whistling Iron the Walrus, which is kind of meant as a slight dig about Paul's 
popular mentality. That said, Hello Goodbye is a fantastic pop song. When it's released, it was the it was it was it spent seven weeks here at number one in the UK, which is um, which was the first big number one, long time number one since She Loves You, which is a lot, which in the Beatles' time was a long time. And so it was, it was a brilliantly crafted song. It was originally called Hello, Hello, and not Hello, Goodbye for a while. And eventually they changed it. And it revolves around Paul's piano playing. And it was recorded onto four track. Um, I think with the four of them, I'm not completely sure, but basically on the, on the tracks you have a piano, which is Paul, drums, which is, which is Ringo, a shaker, which I think is George, and an organ. Now that organ is either Paul doing an overdub or John. But that four track, and this is how the Beatles have moved on. I mean, from, from Pepper and sort of, um, from Pepper onwards, they really started using fours and then bouncing down. So that four track was bounced down to one rhythm track on another tape. So you have, you have piano, organ, drums, and shaker on one track of a new four track tape. And on top of that was laid the chromatic guitar runs and the swells that you hear in the verse, those chromatic guitar runs, I'll play on the piano later but they are just running up, running up the scale of C. Um, and it's funny, it's one of those things that Paul was great at counter melodies. You'll notice in all the songs, he has counter melodies running through stuff. And so they play these on guitars, linked with the voices, singing the backing vocals. And then once they'd put vocals and shakers and rhythm on that, they then moved on to another four track. They bounced those into another four track because he wanted the violins to play that run as well. And you'll hear my dad scored a part just for violins on the record, um, which kind of adds another flavor to it. It's a, it's a, it's a, they're very close mic'd, very, very Beatles in their sound. Um, and, uh, and very hard in a way, hard sounding violins. There's nothing lush about them, which I think is great. And most people, when they, you know, I think it's lessons to be learned now. A lot of people, when they add strings to pop music, they immediately make it sound smooth. And the Beatles, for some reason, I think a lot, a lot down to my, my, my dad's scoring ability. They, he never smoothed anything out with the string parts. If anything, he gave them more life, which I think is tantamount, apart from maybe Good Night, which are deliberately lush. So Hello Goodbye is, is like that. And it's the first real sort of, it was, you know, one of Paul's big outros, um, which was known, they, they, they was known as the Maori section of, uh, of the song, which is just basically around a pedal C and uh, the Hela Hey Helloa. Um, and uh, they actually performed this, I think I had a video where they had English people in hula skirts uh, doing the, not that not that's more Hawaiian than Maori, but Paul's great at doing sing-along outros. I mean, Hey Jude is a classic example. This is another one. So, uh, and, you know, it's, it's with this, actually, I use this as the end of, at the end of Strawberry Fields um, on the Love album as part of an outro, because we, we needed a big outro for Strawberry Fields, and this, this I chopped in, because they're fairly close in keys, only a semitone difference at the end. <laughs> So I say the songs in C, the outros, the outros in C, but you know, it starts off, it starts off with an F. I'll just show the basic chords to you. Um, it starts on, on F sixth, which is F with a D in it. It immediately sounds like Hello Goodbye, which is just this. To a C, to a G seventh, to an A minor seventh. And then it sort of goes into a, a a, a rotation around the G seventh and the A minor, which is that's an A minor, G seventh again, and then it does something where it holds the G and it moves around G, C, and F, and goes into a very McCartney descending bass line while the rising melody, which is just simply. A flat. Same again. To B flat. Which sets up the C again back into the verse. 
same chords. And so on. And it's kind of very clever pop writing where everything is a rise, really. It just moves, it, 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 you know, it moves from an F to a G to a C and then re resolve down again. Aside from the obvious clean sound to play the chords, the tone for Hello Goodbye um, just has a slightly overdriven uh, kind of sound, a tube amp sound with a bridge pickup on the electric guitar um, for fills where you're playing the those types of bends. You just want to make sure there's enough distortion on the sound. So I've got the gain up and the bridge uh, pickup on the guitar, and I've got actually a little, little more distortion um, from a pedal in line, but it's really pretty simple. You just want to make sure you have a semi-distorted sound with the bridge pickup. And that's the tone for Hello Goodbye. <laughs> Hello Goodbye by the Beatles. The song's in the key of C in standard tuning. And the majority of this song is played on the piano. There's not much guitar going on at all. But as far as making a guitar arrangement, we'd start the verse, or the opening of the song as well, with the F6 chord. And this is just like a first position F chord. My first finger's across the strings one and two at the first fret. My second finger's on the second fret of the third string. My third finger's on the third fret of the fourth string. But I'm adding the D note on the third fret of the second string as well, the fourth finger. So that's F6, just play it and let it ring for a whole note. And then to C major, a basic C major chord, to a basic G7 chord, and then to A minor. So the first four chords again, F6, C major, G7. These are all basic open chords to A minor. And at the A minor chord, there's a little descending bass line that leads down to the G chord right down the C scale. So strum the A minor and then play the open third string G, third, second, open on the fourth string, third, second, open on the fifth string, down to the third fret of the sixth string. So that's G, F, E, D, C, B, A, G. Or A minor, G, F, E, D, C, B, A, G. Leading into a G7 chord, for one measure to A minor, back to G7. G, C over G, G7 to F over G. So that's a little tricky. You start with the G chord, uh, fretted with the open second string. And then add your first finger on the first fret of the second string and your second finger on the second fret of the fourth string for C over G. So you get G, C over G to G7. Again, that's G, C over G, G7. And that'd be one, two, three, four, and then there's a two, four measure where you're gonna play an F major chord over G. So you notice I still have the third finger on the G bass note, and my first finger is, uh, and second finger are basically fretting that F chord that we started with, uh, without the six on it, and my fourth finger's on the third fret of the fourth string, so that's F major over G for two beats. So the whole part again will sound like this, F6, C major, G7, A minor, G, A minor, G7, and ending on that F over G. So that's the verse for Hello Goodbye. For the chorus, you're going to start on a basic C major chord, and the idea is that the bass line is going to drop down, uh, right down the scale, so you're going to get a C on the 3rd fret of the 5th string, to a B on the 2nd fret of the 5th string, to the open 5th string, to the G on the 3rd fret of the 6th string, so you get C, C over B, and that's A minor 7 to C over G and then down to F major, so the basic F major bar chord, first fingers across the first fret, all six strings, the second fingers on the second fret of the third string, third fingers on the third fret of the fifth string, and the fourth fingers on the third fret of the fourth string. So it's F major, 
And then moving up to A flat 6, this is basically the same bar chord shape from F up 3 frets, but we're going to add the 6th fret on the 2nd string for a, a 6, so that's A flat major 6, back to C. So, so far that's the first half of the chorus, C, C over B, A minor 7, C over G, F, A flat 6, back to C, C over B, A minor 7, C over G, F, and this time rather than A flat 6, we're going to go to B flat 9, so this, that's kind of a tricky chord to hold in uh, open position. My, my second finger is on the first fret of the fifth string, the open fourth string, and then the first fret on strings 3 and 2. Back to C, so the whole chorus will sound like this, C, C over B, A minor 7, C over G, F, A flat 6, C, C over B, A minor 7, C over G, F, B flat 9, C. And that's the chorus for Hello Goodbye. mention some of the counter melodies and leads that are actually on the, the real recording. And one of the most important ones would be the part during the chorus where you're just walking up the C scale. I'm going to play it in time and then explain it slowly. So that starts in eighth notes, you're just walking directly up the C major scale, third to the fifth fret on the fifth string, second, third, and fifth fret on the fourth string, second, fourth, and fifth fret on the third string. So again, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And then coming back down to the second fret of the fourth string and going up the scale four notes, E, F, G, A. That's the second, third, fifth uh, fret on the fourth string and the second fret on the third. So. And then you just repeat that, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, E, F, G, A, and the very end of it, over the B flat 9 chord, you're going to play the first fret on the third string, the note A flat, third fret on the fourth string for F, and then D and C at the fifth and third fret of the fifth string. So again, the whole part one more time. So that's the counter melody during the chorus. There's another part during the A minor chords in some of the verses where he does a release bend. Um, you're actually on the A note on the 10th fret, and the idea is to, on the 10th fret of the second string, you're going to bend this up a minor third, or the equivalent of three frets from an A to a C, and just bring it down in quarter notes. So you hold it up to the C note, pick it, and release it down to the A on the 10th fret. Pretty simple. And then the next one is during the outro. Uh, simple bend there from the seventh fret on the third string, twice up a whole step from D to E. And then you're playing the fifth fret on the second string to the fifth fret on the third string to the seventh fret on the third string, down to the fifth fret on the third string, just sort of emulating that vocal melody. So those are the counter melodies and leads for Hello Goodbye. The outro begins at the uh, last chorus where you play A flat 6, and it's just a descending bass line um, that we're going to put some chords to, and the bass line itself starts in the A flat, A flat. So in terms of the bass notes there, that's A flat on the 4th fret of the 6th string to G on the 3rd fret, uh, G flat or F sharp on the 2nd fret, down to F on the 1st fret, and then to a C chord. So in terms of harmonizing that, if you wanted to just strum chords, you could play the A flat 6 to C minor, 
G in the bass. And so for this, I'm just barring the entire third fret. My second finger's on the fourth fret of the second string. My third finger's on the fifth fret of the fourth string. My fourth finger's on the uh, fifth fret of the third string, C minor. And then D7 over F sharp. So for this, I've got the second finger on the F sharp bass note. I'm muting the fifth string. Open fourth string, second fret on the third string, first fret on the second, and the second fret on the first string. So D7 to F major, and then just a C. So again, that'd be A flat six, C minor over G, D7 over F sharp to F major to C. The simpler way to play that would be to not really worry about the bass line, just play the chords. So you get C minor, D7, F, right to C. And after that, it just stays on the C chord on the on the real outro of the song where they're just the halo part. So it's just. It just stays on the C and fades out. So that's the outro for Hello Goodbye. This is the performance of Hello Goodbye. Say go.